Hey everybody, this is Brandon Ford and welcome to another edition of the Blind Rage Podcast. This week we are doing Perfect Fit from 2001, starring one of my favorites, Maria Ford, Alexander Polinsky, Renee Humphrey, and David Grieco, directed by a B-movie familiar... Uh, Donald P. Borcher. I see his name all over the place when I used to watch these kinds of movies growing up. Anyway, uh, yeah. I don't have much to lend to this introduction, so I'm just going to make with the formalities before we get into the movie. I want to encourage you all to follow me on Instagram. You can find me at writer Brandon Ford. Check out my titles on Amazon.com by going to the Amazon homepage or the Amazon app, hitting the drop down, selecting books, typing Brandon, typing in Brandon Ford. There you'll find my author page as well as my titles. You can check those out in paperback and Kindle editions. You can also find me on Audible. Uh, by going to audible.com or opening the audible app typing in brandon ford and you'll find several of my vo- books available in audiobook format uh, lastly if you'd like to reach out with any questions comments concerns critiques opinions suggestions recommendations feel free to email me directly or you could even send me a message on instagram if you prefer but you could email me directly at blindragepod81 at gmail.com. That's blindragepod81 at gmail.com. For those of you who want to watch along, I have no idea where to find this movie. It's kind of obscure, so I'm sure it's on YouTube. Um, DVDs out of print. As far as I know, it's pretty pricey. It's not on Blu-ray, not that I know of. Um, but yeah, if you want to watch along, YouTube is your best bet. I am watching the DVD, which is 20 years old. And uh, yeah, I'm going to start with a uh, 3 to one count, and then we're going to get straight into it. This doesn't have any logos or anything like that it doesn't even have any menus so it just uh the movie just start uh there's some stupid for some trailers for some pretty bad low budget movies and then we just get straight into the movie so not even any commentaries nothing so okay let's get going three two one play all right so this is perfect fit of from 2001 whenever i think of this movie for some reason i always think of it as a 90s film because it feels so 90s and it kind of looks very 90s um this is before uh, i really don't like to talk about this because i feel like you know it's inappropriate but i say lots of inappropriate things in my commentary so um but because i love maria so much uh this is before she went kind of crazy with all the plastic surgery so that's why i guess that's one of the reasons why i i associate this with a night with one of her 90s films um because she looks kind of much like she did in the 90s except for the boobs she got the boobs here boobs she got about 98 um so this was this was um after her string of low budget Roger Corman films some of which I did for B movie Bonanza this was after the trio of I don't well I think um couple were Skinamax movies. One was for the Playboy channel. Uh, they were softcore. Uh, yeah, they, The Key to Sex. 
I like to play games too. And Night Calls the Movie Part 2. Not her finest moments, I have to say. And yeah, those DVDs, especially I like to play games too, are pretty pricey titles on DVD. Uh, I don't have them, but I wouldn't mind owning them just for Maria. Because I'm, I've, all, I've been a huge fan of hers and I remain such. And I think it's, a, it's unanimous among fans of Maria that this is one of her best performances. It's not one of her best films, but it's definitely one of her best performances. I think that this one tried to be very quirky and uh, tongue-in-cheek and in some ways it's, it succeeds in some ways and it doesn't. The concept of killing people for their genes is a bit off the wall. Uh, however, I don't think it's off the wall enough, but I don't know, that's just me. In some moments of the, in the movie are very serious. Some moments are very quirky. And, um, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I would give it a, be, uh, maybe a six and a half, maybe seven out of ten. Uh, I wouldn't give it a five. Definitely wouldn't. I definitely don't think I would give it anything higher than a 7 out of 10. <laughs> so yeah, this is Alexander Polinsky doing the voiceover. And, you know, when I think of Maria Ford movies, I don't really think of this. Oh, there's Bill Burr. Um, I don't really think of him. I don't really think of Maria as this being as Maria's movie because while she is the female lead this is more Alexander Polinsky's character with his name is Dick which I think was a very conscious choice and what who, who somebody his age would not be going by Dick um, although I think um, I think Maria does Maria's character Perry does call him Richard I don't remember this has been ages since I've seen this movie, to be honest, and it's not some. It's not one that I've seen a lot. It's some. It's one that I've seen a handful of times. I've seen more of her older titles, um, more times than I've seen this one, because uh, I think they're more fun. Her older titles titles are more fun. This one, I think kind of takes itself too seriously in the kind of film it wants to be if that makes any sense and i don't think it does but yeah it, it i don't know but uh yeah this is this is alexander polinsky from charles in charge and he looks very this is 2001 charles in charge has been off the air for what nine ten years at minimum i think actually more than that um but he still looks like he just walked off the set of charles in charge he looks about 12 years old he looks like a little boy and he looks ridiculous with maria's character perry who is very much a woman she is very much a grown woman a grown beautiful tall voluptuous woman and here's alexander who is this short average looking guy who looks more like a kid uh very pale scrawny and he's got that high voice i don't know if he passed not that it matters but, um, I think we, uh, I think we passed, uh, Kato Kalin's cameo. Uh, 
This is a, this would, this would very much be something that I think would happen to me if I ever went to clubs or bars by myself, which I never did, even in my bar club days. I did it, actually did an experiment. I don't know if I ever talked about this before, but I, I am a socially awkward person and I'm one of those people who never speaks to people in public settings unless they speak to me first because it has never gone well for me in the past and i conducted an experiment just for the fuck of it there's renee humphrey um but i conducted an experiment one night in the summer i don't remember i must have been like 22 23 and it was about 11, 11.30, and I decided to put on a pair of jeans, nice pair of shoes, nice shirt, go by myself to a neighborhood bar where I knew a lot of people my age at the time were would frequent. And I sat at the bar and I had a beer and I, I wanted to see if anybody would talk to me if anybody would approach me because like i said i don't talk to people unless they talk to me first and i've never had the best luck with with meeting people in public settings or talking to people in public settings for uh, making the first move so i sat there i had my bar i was sat there for about 20 minutes nobody spoke to me no, i don't even think anybody looked at me so <laughs> left the tip, got up and left. And that was, that was my experiment. And it went pretty much exactly as I thought it was going to. No, I went and, and I wasn't trying to pick anybody up that I don't want, I don't want that to come across. I wasn't trying to pick anybody up. I just want to see if anybody would talk to me, if maybe, uh, maybe I can make a friend. I don't know. May I'd see where it went. But sex was not on my agenda. I just wanted to see where things would lead. This is really mean. And this is a character who we're supposed to feel sorry for, D Dick or Richard. Um, you know, I, I can't remember her name, Renee Humphrey, her character, her character's name, but she is one of his only friends in Los Angeles. And Amanda, there you go. Yeah, and he says, I really need a friend. But okay, what just happened was he called her up because he wasn't having the best of luck with meeting people or socializing in this club or bar or whatever it was. And so he called her up and asked her to meet him and so they talk for a little bo a little while and then this you know cool guy you know is played by david greco shows up and he hustles a man out the door and because he's embarrassed of her because amanda is not the bombshell that maria ford is and he was yeah he was embarrassed to be seen with her especially in front of this cool guy david greco um, and yeah, he pushes, he pushes her at the door, hustles her to her car, but then he begs to, to have coffee or something with her the next day. And he, and he says, you know, come on, I really need a friend right now. I think that they were in a relationship before and it didn't work out. And I'm not sure if it's explained why, but I believe he probably broke up with her because he didn't see her as as relationship material because she wasn't pretty enough she wasn't voluptuous enough she wasn't busty enough i think yeah he was ashamed of her and i and he's uh, i think that um he had this idea for this perfect woman uh, on the outside and Amanda didn't fit that mold so but yeah 
at the same time, and I don't remember what Michael, uh, David Grieco's character said about her during this, during this scene, well, during the moments where after Dick returned to the table, I can't call somebody Dick without feeling absolutely ridiculous, but I can't, I don't remember what he said about her after, uh, Dick returned to the table, but he, he put her down in some way. I don't remember. He called her something. And uh, he says, you know, the voiceover says, I hate what, I hated Michael for what he said about, he said about Amanda. And then he burns Michael's leather jacket with uh, Michael's cigarette that he left in the ashtray. And if you took, you know, such offense to someone who you're supposed to care about, why the fuck did you push her out the door? So he's about to make the, uh, make an approach to Maria, AKA Perry. Dick. Our picture helped. This scene is so fucking weird. This whole movie is so weird. There's this drag queen who's about to come up in a second. Wait a minute. I think that's him right there, yeah. Yeah. I I can't remember what he goes by, what his drag name is, but I've seen him in other movies before. But for some reason he's in full he's in full makeup and drag. Yet no wig. He's just a bald head. Pretty scary, from what I remember. She has, and I th I don't know if this was written into her character, or into the script, rather. But her character has this weird thing for those cheese balls. Um, those, uh, you know, like the cheese curls, but in the shape of balls. And she's always eating them, like the planners ones. There's Maria. She's talking now. Okay. It really saddens me that her her acting career is essentially over. I don't understand how we go from uh, lighting her cigarette to the being in bed together. I, I don't. I think we're jump. We jumped the gun just a little bit. Um. Because uh, the first thing he says to her is, "I would do a. I would do anything for you." And uh, she says, why don't we start with the light? He lights her cigarette. And then now we're in the bedroom. So what happened in between? But as I was saying, it really saddens me that her acting career is, is essentially over. And the last, I think, um, well, she has a lot of bit parts. She has a lot of bit parts in her resume. Uh, tiny little roles in movies like Casper Meets Wendy and the Beethoven movies, the, Beet the straight-to-video Beethoven sequels, that is. Uh, and she plays like, you know... Or like she'll have speaking roles, but they're very small speaking roles, like in, mo in movies like The Glass Cage. And I know these things because I used to watch everything that I could find with Maria in it. And I sat through a lot of really, really bad movies just to see her way back when. But she did Beethoven's Big Break, credited as Angry Woman. Before that, she did Eden, uh, playing a, a guard. And then, But before that, her, I think her last real legitimate um, 
acting role. Watching people eat is so disgusting. And I, I don't like this scene. I especially don't like the way she's eating with her hands. And she's fucking ravenous. And she's digging her her fingers in like the, the jar of whatever. And not only is she polishing her own plate, but she's polishing his. And then after, she sucks the grease off of her... It's disgusting. Whenever I have incredible sex, I always eat like a pig. Um, yeah, so I was saying that I think her last, her last, uh, role, I would, I would actually, I would call it an actual role as opposed to a cameo or, um, a bit player was in Wedding Slashers from 2006. A movie that I was very excited to see when I learned that she was in it and I learned that her character actually had a name and of course she's only in the opening scene and she dies and you never see her again I remember expecting to totally hate wedding slashers but it's really not that bad I haven't seen it in a long time but it's not that bad and um, it uh, it's weird there's definitely some weird, uh, there's some incest weirdness in it, and, uh, yeah, it, but it's, it, it's good for what it is, I think. Would have been better if Maria had a bigger role, but, um, she has these, on IMDb, I don't know if they are legitimate credits, and I don't, I would be willing to bet not. But from two that from like 2017 through 2020, there's like maybe maybe be earlier than that because I just and I should know this because I just checked. But um, there's a handful of titles, weird titles, um, that just th that sound like the titles of videos that you would see on YouTube. Like, they don't sound like movies or uh, shorts or anything like that. And in all of them, she's credited as a dancer. And in one of them, she's credited as a Latin dancer. Or the title of the movie is, is like Maria Ford, Sexy Latin Dancer or some, some weird shit like that. I don't know. But I don't think that that they are official credits. And I don't think she's Latin either. Um, but not too long ago, I... Um, well, let me just say this first. As I've said before in... in um, as, as I'm sure I've said in, in a few of my previous Maria Ford commentaries, she has always been very, very elusive. She really, she never did conventions. She never did interviews except for the one documentary, Some Nudity Required, where she bashed the industry. And I think that... Um, this is an interesting story that she tells. Um, but, um, what the fuck was I saying? She, uh, yeah, she, she's very private. She doesn't have, um, a, a social media account, at least not one that anybody can find. I'm sure she probably has a, a private account that, and she only adds people that she knows, family or close friends or whatever. And yes, yeah, like I said, she doesn't do interviews. I know that uh, 
there was there was an attempt to get her to do an interview for the Scream Factory Slumber Party Massacre collection. Um, but she didn't have any interest. And I mean, even if he's just to talk about the movie, I don't, I don't understand why she doesn't want to do something like that. But she, she's very, she's a very private person, and you have to respect that. And um, so, but I think that that is to her detriment because you have to make yourself known if you want more roles, and you have to make yourself known if you want to be recognized. And you want to be a name and you want to be out there. And if you want to make a name for yourself in movies like these, I speak like I'm a fucking expert and like I don't have any idea what I'm talking about. But if you want to be a Debbie Rashan or a Julie Strain or a Tiffany Shepis or a Brink Stevens or a Linnea Quigley or a Michelle Bauer and so on and so on and so on, you have to do interviews. You have to make some appearances somewhere you have to be accessible bottom line you have to be accessible and maria has strove throughout the course of her career to do everything that she could to be inaccessible and i think that i don't know i can't say for sure because i don't know anything about her personal life really because she she never spoke about it I know very little about her upbringing. I know what she says in the Some Nudity Required documentary about her frustration with the industry. But as far as Maria as a person, I don't, I don't know. I don't know much about her. I know that she's religious. I know that she's a, a Christian. Practic um, uh, This scene is so fucking weird, and this is this is something that shouldn't be taking place. First of all, because let me this is a sidebar. Um, there's a scene. This, what's going on right now is uh, Alexander Polinsky's character Richard or Dick is in a men's room stall. He's on the toilet, and he's talking to someone between the stalls. And he thinks that he's kind of making a friend and little does he know that the guy's not responding to him. The guy's on the on his cell phone and he's talking to whoever's on the line. He's not talking to Dick. And he is embarrassed when he emerges. But it goes to show how desperate he is to make friends in this city. Um, I was talking about Maria. Um, yeah, so she's been ex inaccessible. You don't really know anything about her except for what's in the, in the documentary, Some Nudity Required. She, where she vents a lot of her frustrations about the industry and the way she's been treated. And with all that she says, you kind of have to wonder why she would even want to continue in the industry. But... Um, so not that long ago, maybe a few months ago, actually, I really, um, I really went, I don't know if I would say above and beyond, but I really applied myself in scouring the internet to find information about Maria's whereabouts these days what she's been doing if she has any movies in the works there's an interview um that i did find on youtube a while back with the director of eden a movie that she did where she played a, a guard and this director was planning a movie called rabid which was not the um, movie that those sisters did that was a remake of the David Cronenberg movie although it did sound like it and for a while there was an IMDB page for it and Ron Jeremy was supposed to be in it but uh, this director I think she was trying to crowd finance it 
and it didn't work out. I don't know, because this was a while ago. This was something that I, I'd been hearing about for several years, and it just, it I don't think it ever got off the ground. And it might have been good for Maria had it um, come to fruition. It would have been better had it been good. Um, but I don't know. And I guess we never will because I don't think the movie's ever going to get made. And Maria is in her 50s now. So um, I don't know. Not that 50s is old. Not that she's over the hill. Not that she is doesn't have the right to be sexy or sexual anymore. Um, but I just don't see her doing these kinds of roles anymore. And I'm sure that while I don't, I don't know much about the rabid script, I do, I would imagine that there would be some kind of skin, um, Okay, this is the first scene where they steal blue jeans from. I think they just killed um, Michael. Fuck, I should have watched this before I did this commentary. Um, but yeah, so nothing, nothing came of the this movie Rabid. And the Salska sisters, I think that's how you say their name, they did their rabid remake in the time between this, uh, this, this other movie and now. So that's out, and it's terrible from what I hear. So, yeah, I, I, I scoured the internet to try to find some information about her, about Maria, and I don't know how reliable this is, but I found something on some sort of message board that was pretty recent. And this person said, this person said that he'd come to find that Maria has been, um, I think she's actually been touring doing um, stage act as a belly dancer and she has a routine or she has routines and she performs at I don't know what kinds of venues where you were um, I would assume clubs and stuff but she's that's supposedly what she's been doing and yeah, I guess that's how she's making her living these days. I, I wait. That's one of my favorite moments in the movie. Okay, you listen to me. And that's Maria. Um. See, she does do very well in this in this movie because she's a it's a quirky script and she's a quirky character and you really never saw her do quirky before. She was always the siren. Uh, she was always the seductress. She uh, was sometimes the victim. Um, she was never really not that I can think of in the movies that I've seen she was never really um, a, a, an assertive character she was never really in charge she was never really domineering and in this one she is she very much is in, in the driver's seat 
with the re- with the relationship between her and and Dick, and um, so I definitely think this is this is a departure of um, from from a lot of her previous movies, the majority, in fact, and I don't know if I said this already because I'm it, this is the middle of the night and I'm doing another another late night commentary but Jim Wynorski who you know the the great Jim Wynorski who directed many many a B film Chopping Mall, Sorority House Massacre 2, Hard to Die the list goes on and on and on and on people seem to like Munchie, I've never seen it but okay um, I love Jim Jim has worked with Maria several times in uh, Haunting of Morella, Wasp Woman. Uh, what else did he do that she was in? Uh, yeah, he, he worked with her a handful of times. And I think he enjoyed working with her. Yeah, I, yeah, because he did a commentary on the Haunting of Morella DVD. And he did have some positive things to say about her. And he did have some positive things to say about this movie. He really liked it. And I thought that was cool of him to say that. Um, he really didn't have to. So that was nice. And um, I'm sure that if he wanted or if she wanted if he wanted to cast her, he would. Whether she would do it, I don't know. I think that she's tr really trying to distance herself from the movies that she did in the 90s. In particular, the this, this softcore stuff. But, um, but yeah, a lot of the Corman movies that um, she did the Dan Golden movies. She played uh, uh, many a stripper. Many a stripper. And while I like a lot of those stripper movies, I think... And I like her in them. I think... I don't think it was wise for her to have chosen so many stripper roles. But... At the same time, I can understand why she did because she had a lot of trouble getting roles, as she says in the Some Nudity Required documentary, and that was because she refused to play ball with producers who wanted her to earn the roles via red carpet. <sighs> cast and couch situations and they also wanted to change her appearance they also wanted her they wanted her to get uh, some some plastic surgery on her face they wanted her to augment her breast things that she was very much against at the time that the documentary was filmed and then she went ahead and did everything that she was expected of and more so, I don't know, like, it just came across as very hypocritical and it didn't show her in the best light. And it's a shame because, like I said, I, uh, many times actually, I'm, I'm a big fan and I think that she is, is um, while she hasn't been in the best movies and she oftentimes is the best thing in those movies, I do think that she's a credible actress and um, I think she deserved to be in better. And she she can be funny too. Um, like I said, she this is this is this is a quirky role. There is some comedy to it, although toward the end it does kind of get dark, but. She can she can be funny. She has some good timing. I thought she did really well on the episode of uh, the Drew Carey show that she was on, Assault with a Lovely Weapon. 
in the ninth season of the show. If you haven't seen that episode, I highly recommend you check it out on YouTube. It's really funny. Unfortunately, she plays a stripper in it. Um, and also, unfortunately, she has a lot of cosmetic surgery in it. Um, and I'm sure this is all stuff that I've spoken about before, but it's been so long since I've done, since I've done a Maria Ford commentary that, uh, that, uh, I don't remember what the hell I said. Um, the boobs, I can understand. And they look good, from what I remember. They look good. She definitely, they definitely did, a, her doctor definitely did a good, did a good job. They might have been a little too big maybe but i think they, they look good um the face work i don't think she needed i don't think that she needed those those uh i think she had a lot of filler a lot of fillers in her face um because her cheeks were inflated and her lips were inflated and she just looked very puffy and i don't know what she looks like these days um but it it uh uh like the line that's coming up where he because he meets this daisy character and maria's maria says i don't want to see you talking to any little flowers this is a weird moment i forgot about this scene with the dance and I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if Maria insisted upon this scene being included in the film because she has obviously a passion for dance and, um, I think that, uh, she probably assumed it would be a, uh, it would enhance the film in some way, but I don't, I don't think it, it does anything. Um. And, and there is, also, I want to mention this. Wait, here we go. There you go. See, um... Um, I forgot what I was about to say. Um, oh, the, the, uh, the quotes from the girlfriend rule book. I don't know what that was. I could have sworn I just heard something, but I could be mistaken. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna. That's a weird moment where she pours the, the cheese balls on him. Again, that's her fetish with the cheese balls. Um, okay, two things I wanted to say. Two things I wanted to say were... were and I got to get this out, get these out before I forget. But the first being that um, the movie starts, I believe it starts, or if it doesn't start, it, 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 it comes into play pretty quickly. But there's these quotes from a publication called The Girlfriend Rule Book which I don't think actually exists, but I could be wrong. But it's... There's a, there's a quote from it right there. Maybe this was the first time that he... he that this uh, quote is... Um, that a quote from this book is utilized because this is when that... Um, when... Uh, he actually gets a girlfriend, which is probably his first, well, maybe a second, because we kind of count Amanda. I think this is creepy that he wakes up in the middle of the night and she's just lying there staring at him. And 
as the girlfriend rule book says, never go to sleep when your girlfriend is upset. And he does. And that fucks up the whole relationship. And you would think that as badly as he wanted not only a girl like Perry, but specifically Perry, that he would be doing everything in his power to keep her. But um, he does kind of fuck up a bit by talking to that girl Daisy in the bar and letting her go to bed angry and showing general indifference toward her and she leaves and there's a, another quote see okay now we're getting girlfriend rule book quotes rapid fire now which said the second one Nice calling her to try to reconcile. But, um, I don't know. I guess you, you can forgive him to a degree because he fucked up. He knows he fucked up. But as someone, uh, Dick is a very desperate character. That That is the, yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> ironically. Or funnily enough, or interestingly enough, there's another girlfriend rule book quote right there. But interestingly enough, he just said, I was, I'm, I was desperate, right? When I said he's a very desperate character. But as desperate a character, he is, as desperate a character as Dick is, not just to have a girlfriend like Perry, but to have more people in his life because he leads a very lonely life his only real friend is the douchebag michael who's now dead and his on again all off again friend slash ex-girlfriend amanda who doesn't really seem to know what the fuck she wants oh, there she is See, and he uses her. He's such a fucking... He really lives up to the name of his character. Um... Because, uh... Perry isn't calling him back. Perry broke up with him. And he goes crawling back to Amanda. Once again. And... I think the proper term... Or the proper phrase... To... Portray... To, um, and look, he's giving her a gift. I don't know what it is. I think this was something, whatever the fuck it is. It's something that he originally bought for Perry, and then he decides to give it to Amanda. So he's giving Amanda mixed signals. But what I was trying to say was, I think what you can say about Dick, um, as far as Amanda is concerned, is he wants her when he wants her. And when he wants her is when he has no one else. Um, she is his last resort and I think it's kind of fucked up I've spoken about this movie before not um what does that mean that was pretty clear I can't see you anymore it wasn't working out maybe someday we can be friends what is that? <laughs> that was pretty straightforward. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, what I was about to say was with Renee Humphrey, um, I always, I don't know if I ever mentioned this movie before, um, but whenever I think of her, 
I always think of, mo- of a movie that she did that I'm, per- I'm sure I probably mentioned somewhere at some point during some commentary. But she did a movie called Fun with Alicia Witt that I saw when I was 15 or part of it when I was 15. This sounds a lot like Smack My Bitch Up or whatever that fucking... Um, which I saw when I was 15 or part of it when I was 15 because I had to turn it off because it really fucking got to me. But it was Alicia Witt and Renee Humphrey. Did I say the name? Yeah, it's called Fun. Um, and they brutally murder an elderly woman just for the fuck of it. And it's, it's horrible. And it was based on a true story. And it was a movie that got, I think it's it's the movie that it's a movie that got to me more than any other i know because it's it's a brutal stabbing murder of an elderly woman who was being very kind to those to the girls at uh, just before they attack her and i'm sure now that i'm almost 40 if I saw it now, well, I couldn't see it now, even if I wanted to, but, um, if I saw it now, it wouldn't have the same kind of effect on me as it did when I was 15. Nevertheless, I don't want to take that chance, um, because it really, really got to me and it's remains one of the most disturbing films I've ever seen. And I'm sure there are people out there who have seen it and think it's nothing. Jesus. I like that alarm. It's funny. Um, I'm sure there are people who have seen the movie. And I know it had some accolades. I know the movie had some accolades. It did some. It did win some awards at some festivals. It was well re- well received. Um, and there are people who probably laugh at this this scene that I'm talking about. But we'll take a pill. That's funny. I, I like that. That is, I don't think that that does or ever existed. In case you can't hear, the car alarm is screaming, I've been tampered with over and over again because he kicked, he started violently kicking it. And he's kicking the car of a guy who Perry has been hooking up with. Oh, here's now Carter. Toward the end of her life, obviously. Oh, poor Nell Carter. Who did not love Give Me a Break? She was so funny. I mean, all she played, all she did was play herself, but she was still very funny. Um... I, I, I think I do. <laughs> you like 
I think this is the only scene that she's in. They were called right next to mine. Two nap metropolitan. Now, I might be getting old, but I can certainly recognize my own car. Wow. Oh my god, she sounded like a parrot there. Bonk. Um I think, well, I would assume that he kind of pulled away from her because he was a little... He was a little, uh, well, more than a little put off by the hit and run and having to steal uh, Michael's um, jeans or Perry convincing him to steal Michael's jeans. It was a bit weird. Uh, I'm also going to run the uh, make and model through the DMV. You know, the coroner said the guy was loaded at the time of death. I thought I'd check out some of the local bars and restaurants. Not too many of them are open. Like There's a scene that, um... Yeah, bring your jeans. Uh, what do you mean back in the line? You've been letting me in here for the past four weeks. Is that Bill Berlig Bergen? Yeah, there he is. I know his voice. Um, and he's, he's credited as Billy Burr here. This was really, this was before he really popped as a stand-up. I love Bill Burr. He's fucking awesome. Um, but, uh, fuck, what was I saying? Uh, I, um, yeah, I think that is the main reason why he kind of pulled away and, um, he he wasn't sure what he wanted in those moments because of the side that Perry showed to him in that, you know, she's a fucking psycho. But because she's so gorgeous, I think he, he realizes, yeah, I can deal with that. Um, but she is definitely unhinged. And I think I, one of my favorite moments in the film, because it's so weird, and but because she looks so gorgeous and she and she's very very sexy, um, in it. But and she's naked a lot in this movie, but she's lying naked in the on the bed and she is painting her nails, and she's on the phone with dick and i don't remember exactly what the conversation is but things don't go her way and she's kind of miffed and she doesn't know what to do so she just pours the nail polish on herself and then rubs it in to her skin and it's weird but it's also it's also very sexual or it's very sexy at the same time and i think i've made it clear before that um, girls are, are not my, my deal, but I can certainly appreciate a beautiful woman and Maria was beautiful. I'm sure she probably still is. Maybe she's very, very sexy in this movie. She's got a great body. She's very much in shape. I think the boobs, although they are store bought, they, they, they work. Like I said, I think they might be a little too big, but they still work. Okay, that wasn't even a fucking clever line. It was just dumb.
Well, that was a missed opportunity. Oh, shit, I forgot what I was about to say. But, yeah, that was a missed opportunity because, yeah, this fucking douchebag that she's with now says his car is his baby, you know. And, um, he had some... And I... There's another girlfriend rule book quote. But, um, he says his car is his baby or some shit like that. And, um, you know, he, this is their... Oh... Oh, he's fucking it up again. I forgot about this. But, yeah, th 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 I think that was a missed um, missed opportunity because he said that... He hit somebody and he says, that was for fucking with my baby, meaning his car. And then he hits him again and he says, and that's for being a dick. And I think it would have been better if he had said, and that's for messing with my girl or something like that or you know my other baby and then motion to parry or so, something you know like I think that would have been better but there there is a scene that's coming up in a little bit because they do reconcile and they do get back together and there's a scene where um Dick and Perry are in the bathtub together I thought oh, that's why if they get back together he he runs them over but they're in the bathtub together and you don't know what they're doing because you can only see you can only see Perry who is of course topless or naked um, and she's just kind of like working her arms and her upper body and the boobs are jiggling and 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 um Dick is just kind of leaning back against the the tub and you think that she's doing or sure you're supposed to think that she's doing something sexual to him but in all actuality they're in a bathtub full of cold water and she is trying to um or is it warm water I don't know what is it yeah it's warm water hot water you gotta have hot water to uh, shrink something. So, yeah, they're in a bathtub full of hot water, and she's trying to um, uh, make the do. I don't know. I don't know exactly how you do it. I just know you just put, if you want your jeans to shrink, you just put them, just wash them in hot water. But she's doing something to, to make them fit a little better. And when he stands up, he says, perfect fit, right? So, yeah. Um,. But I was always I was always curious about how that worked because it's hard for me to find jeans that fit really well because I have short legs. I'm a short guy. I don't like this music. I think this, this music is up the quirk factor. And when do we get to Paul Bartel, R.I.P., and Mary Warnov, or Warnov, Warnov, I never knew how to fucking say her name. But the great Paul and Mary of Paul and Mary's Country Kitchen. And if you don't know what the fuck that means, you better seek out Eating Raul ASAP. Cult fucking classic. Um, but yeah, they, I think they must have been close friends because they've appeared a lot together in, in productions that Paul wrote himself and as couples, married couples and other things. They have, they have a cameo at the very beginning of Chopping Mall, but they appear in this movie as, um, Dick's parents. And I think that Mary playing Dick's mother um might play a role in 
his attraction to someone like Perry, who is also well, Mary is is quite um she's she's um there's a name for her could there's a really long montage with this awful music but there's a there's a name for the kind of condition that she has where like everything's unclean and she's always washing and she's afraid she's she's afraid of diseases that she's always cleaning everything and she wears she was basically basically wears a hazmat suit and she wears rubber gloves all the time and she's just she's not mentally stable um and i think growing up with a mother like that oh there he is there's paul i love paul Bertel. Oh God! You're not really going to talk about Ed Gein, are you? I don't remember this part of Ed Gein um, mythos or not mythos, lore, not, not lore, you know, Ed Gein uh, chronology, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. I think that this scene is supposed is included because it's supposed to be saying something. Yeah, I yeah, that that was it. All for a bad joke. Oh, they're not even together. I forgot. So we go right from a from the dad scene to the mom scene. Oh no, this is the bathtub scene. Oh, 
Mm -hmm. Your head. I mean, I've had these bitches. I bet your head will probably still be right from the shower when I was like, okay. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of shrink on. Hey, Dick, it's Harry. My old friend in OC. How's it going? Mm, same old, same old, right? You got a room to play? Sure, help yourself, buddy. Is that Bill Burr again? He's in more. He's in this more than I thought. You guys think it's safer? I don't need to stress. Oh, hey, look, relax. They had breakfast. You know what? They're cooler than you. I swear. I think they say, but I must have talked over it. I must not have been paying attention. But I, I don't, I don't really remember what uh, Dick does for work. Not that it really matters, but you never see him at work. But see, the thing about this movie is, from the very, from the very, very beginning in the voiceover it speaks or vo yeah in the voiceover it, it it sounds like dick is somebody who came from like a small middle american town to los angeles and he is having a lot it, it seems like he's having a lot of trouble adjusting because the it's a it's a huge los angeles is a huge city and it's hard to meet people. It's hard to make friends when you when you move to any, when you relocate to anybody. Eh, fuck. When you relocate, reloc fuck me. When you relocate to a foreign land, and you don't know anybody, it's it's hard, especially when you're an adult. But um, he does say something about being a native Californian uh, later in the movie, and. I don't know if he's a native Los Angelin. I think so. Um, but yeah, I mean, it. there for sure are people who, like myself, have trouble making connections with people in the real world. And they've lived there their whole lives. Oh, this is the undercover cop scene. Uh, no, you're not. It was bad acting. But there are people who have have issues making making connections with people in in uh, in real life, and they've lived in in they've lived in a city their whole their whole. I ah, fuck. What the fuck point was I trying to make? I'm really getting tired. It's really fucking late, and then I think that I think this is sort of kind of turning into an insomniac commentary. Um, fuck. What the fuck was I saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I what I was the point that I was trying to make was that it's difficult to make connections with people. Um, when you're an adult, I think more so when you move to a, a new city, but Dick has lived, I believe, in Los Angeles his whole life, which, oh God, I think this is a, um, Right, you're fucking this distracting me. Could you shut up for a minute? Yeah, I'm talking to the TV. That's how tired I am. But um, when, 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 when you're somebody of who has a certain kind of personality, I think it's hard to make friends in general. And as as I said earlier, and as is seen earlier in the film, Dick. Uh-oh, he's with Amanda. 
And when Amanda, she, Amanda like has her own theme. It's funny. I just, I just realized that because whenever Amanda's on screen, they play this like very simple piano, like light piano melody. Um, and I, I would be willing to bet that it's, it's meant to represent Amanda's soft, gentle nature, that she's the polar opposite to Perry. And another girlfriend rule book quote. I think this is the scene with the nail polish. He wanted her first. He wanted her so badly. He fucked it up. Then he wanted her back so badly. And he's fucking it up again. Um, and, by, and by saying, you know, we're, we're a team. But we're not joined at the hip. And then hanging up without telling her he loves her. Ooh, that's bad. And she's clearly not happy about it either. Okay, here's Mary. I think. Yeah, there she is. Yeah, I think she. Poisons, toxins, and germs, oh my. But she's convinced that these poisons, toxins, and germs, oh my, have killed um, Dick. Even though he's sitting right before her, I don't, but you can't, you can't really expect to believe I mean, you can't really expect to understand somebody who is as unstable as. I think it's the best pre death photo I have of you. Oh, Dickie, will you still be alive if only my milk had been pure? Oh. I didn't know that I was causing an infection and I was nursing you. The doctors didn't tell me anything. I know, Mom, but it's not their fault. I should have seen it. So she thinks that she killed him from when he was a baby. If I just hadn't been afraid to look at you, I'm sure I would have seen it. Mom, how could I be afraid of my own son? My own son! I hate this so much. You gotta stop. Go. I'm sorry, Dad. I, see, this is going too far. I, you can't keep humor in her like this. It's, it's not getting any better. Dead. We just celebrated my 24th birthday. He's only 24? Or he's 24? He looks about, like I said, he looks about 12. Your soul. You can imagine how hard it is for me with you 
still talking and walking around. See? It's so very, very strange. I've been saying for years, all this family need a break from communication. Oh, I feel better already. I think this is an oddball title that would be good for uh, vinegar syndrome. I really do. But uh, the only um, Murray Ford movies that I know of, which are available in blue on Blu-ray, are part of franchises, and it's Slumber Party Three, of course, and I think I think Deathstalker Four. I think, or maybe not. I don't know. He, and he's with Amanda again. This is not good. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't understand why. And oh, I don't understand why none of her movies are coming out on Blu-ray. But it's not just her movies. It's a lot of the Roger Corman movies of the 90s, which were in abundance. Um, I haven't been able to... I sincerely doubt that um, Concord will be putting anything out on Blu-ray because they don't... They don't um, want to put the, I don't think they want to put the proper, the, the, I don't think they want to put the money behind a disc to get, or, or a negative to get it properly mastered or remastered in 4K and make it look as good as it can and get some director commentaries and some um, interviews and it would be great if they found some Maria Ford movies and got her to sit down for an interview. Um, but I don't see that happening. Really? What? What is this? Okay, first of all, she said, you've been a lot of things to me, but up until now you've been cruel. He's been cruel to her uh, more than he's been nice. And then he makes his line up at a quickie. I don't know what the fuck is going on with him. And now he's chasing after Amanda like he chased after Perry. I've become obsessed with my own selfishness. That's a weird line. And there's a theme again. That's totally Amanda's theme. Dun, dun, dun. You got little kisses. Oh my god, are they fucking? Once you've cheated, please don't go home. Please go for the book, page 69. Another uh, girlfriend rule book quote. And it's page 69. <laughs>
Oh, he works for his father. Uh-oh. Okay, now we have some weird carnival music here. And I'm sure to join some very strange imagery, which I cannot see, unfortunately. And I don't remember this part. I don't think that I've... I've I think I would probably say... I've seen this movie under 10 times. And for a Maria Ford movie that I like, that is very low. It's very low for a movie that I've owned for 20 years too. If you have police, uh, that was weird. Oh, good evening, officers. Won't you come in? If you if you have police opening and uh, not showing up your, at your door, I expected. Wouldn't you want to know why they're there before you invite them in? <laughs> oh, and by the way, in the future, you might want to erase all ex girlfriend's phone numbers from your address book because it just might come back to you. From your address book? Oh my god. You won't get me anywhere near the end of the year. But if you were, I hope you realize now that that is just not possible. Oh, you would, Amanda. Your knight in shining armies come to rescue you? I don't think so. Your knight has too many secrets to keep. This has gone far enough. Dark secrets. Stop it. For instance, could you love a man who kills for blue jeans? She wants to understand. Oh, wake up, you stupid son of a bitch. Do you really think for one minute she can live with that on her lily white conscience? She's too good. She'll turn us in. Somebody in, a, in, a, in an IMDb review I was, I was reading for this said that she, Marie does very well in this and she does a perfect Jersey girl accent. Huh? 
why would she be doing a perfect Jersey girl accent when this is set in California? Oh. Dear Dick, happy 24th, happy birthday, Bill Amanda. Frank, what's up? Hey, PJ Taylor, honey. This is my real job, baby. Makeup girl to the day. Mrs. Fogarty, Mrs. Jenkins, Mrs. Hollister. This is my boyfriend, Dick. Say hello, Dick. This is such a weird, weird movie. Or you could cremate her. Since you work in, you know, a funeral home. You know, I, I never understood in movies because uh, having a gun, not that gun, the gun isn't loaded. It's such a fucking cliche. Um, I would think that a gun that is loaded, I've never held the real gun before. Let me just say that. But, uh, and I'm just guessing here, but I would, I would think that a gun that's loaded is heavier than a gun that's not loaded. So, wouldn't you know? The gun isn't loaded, Dick. 
Just by holding it that it's not loaded? We have a tussle where I don't know what the fuck is going on. Oh yeah, that was a good, a good one. I really should have or listened, watched, listened to this before I did it because I'm distracted by the voiceover. Because the voiceover does tell a lot of the story. And like I said, it's been a while since I've seen this one. <laughs> the killers here really respect me. It's an odd feeling to be warned by the affection of a monster. Well, that is ironic that he finally found a place to fit in and it was on death row. I, I, I do appreciate that little bit of irony. I can't believe this movie's 20 years old. It's crazy. I remember when it first came out, too, on video, and I wish I had... I wish I had an interesting story. Or... Did, what the hell did I say? Did I say Blu-ray or did I say video? I, I don't know. I, but I do remember when it first came out on video... And I wish I had a more interesting story to tell about how I first saw it, but I don't. 
I just remember, uh, I think my father had gone to Block because my, my mom and pop video store didn't have it. And I just remember him going and uh, asking him to pick it up for me because they had it. And that was it. <laughs> Oh, good. I saved you. I, I took the rap for Perry's murder. You owed me that. You put my life in danger. And you killed people. But they're jeans. I never want to see you again. Don't write. Don't call. Don't expect a fruitcake from me at Christmas. He was dead to me. Oh, he said to her. He's dead to someone else, apparently. Hmm. Really? Yeah, I'm almost positive there's a post credits a post credits scene, but I don't even know if it's worth going through all the credits. But what the fuck else do I have to do? So yeah, that was perfect fit, and I don't know if it holds up. I think it has some good parts, some good moments, some decent performances, in particular by Maria. Um. There's my, that smack my bitch up clown or whatever the fuck it is. Um, all in all, I think it kind of drags a bit. It takes a while to say really what it really wants to say. It takes a while to really start moving. Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of lukewarm on it. Uh... While I think, yes, again, I think this is probably one of her best performances, it's, I, I, I stand by the fact that it's not her best film. What the fuck? This is so weird. They keep changing the music. Like... Like somebody's like fucking switching a uh, a radio dial. They've gone through like four songs already. Three or four songs. And here's another one. It's like the it's like a sampler for the fucking soundtrack or something. Which I don't even think exists. I believe this DVD was put out by Two Left Shoes. And... <laughs> no. No movies by Two Left Shoes have soundtracks. Is that another song, really? Kind of sounds like Michael Bublé a little bit. Okay, I think we're about to come up on the post credits.
They can't kill you now. You've been immortalized. Yeah, now you're a star. Just like me. <laughs> Fuck you, Patty. You ain't no star till you've been on Springer. I've been on Springer six times. Oh, easy, Otto. Hard copy's better than ten times on that stinking ass Springer. <laughs> you and your hard copy can suck my toes. Oh. Yeah, totally, totally unnecessary post credits scene there. Wasn't even funny. And it's still going. What the fuck? That was a perfect fit. And I want to say, as always, I hope it doesn't start playing over again. Okay, good. Yeah, because like I said, the, the DVD doesn't have any menus or uh, anything like that. Um, it just has some stupid trailer for some stupid movie. And then it just goes into perfect fit. Um, so yeah, as always... I want to say thanks very much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the commentary. And until next time, this is Brandon Ford wishing you all unpleasant dreams.